So we are we had some uh, some changes, and uh, we are here in uh, in June with uh, the Dutch case. So in September we'll have the Czech case, and uh, and then uh, Slovakian case in October. Uh, in November, hopefully the German case, and uh, we will finish with the Green League uh, case, as the, we already had the, the British case. And you can find that in uh, on our channel, YouTube channel. So I will just give you the link to it, and then uh, give you the floor again to start this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I will share my screen. Um, which you should be able to see now. Uh, today we're going to look at the uh, at the country case study of the Netherlands, as we have also worked it out in uh, in the URAT uh, publication 917, which is upcoming for publication soon. And um, I've updated it from there to give you an overview of what happens in this weird country, which is not really a big country in the issue of radioactive waste because we only have a, a very small fleet um, of, of installations but we're also not like Denmark one of the small uh, inventory countries it's somewhere in between and the Netherlands plays a bit of a, a bridge function between the developments of the small inventory countries and the larger inventory countries and we'll get back to that later um, the oh i hope that i can get this thing away that would be helpful but it doesn't can you see this without the um it's correct on our side yeah okay so, so there's no zoom no uh, thing in it that's good um the first nuclear reactor in the netherlands was the high flux reactor in in Patton, which is still operational and which is from the nine is from 1960 so that's a reactor which is 40 50 63 years old um, a research reactor in 1968 a small um, reactor for electricity production was started up at Dodewaard in the mid of the country on the um, the river Waal which is one of the Rhine the largest uh, part of the Rhine uh, river and that was mothballed in 1997 um, in an attempt to wait for a decrease of radiation in the reactor. And then it has to be decommissioned in 2045. Um, one of the problems that we're facing with that, um, that mothballed nuclear power station, which does not contain any fuel anymore, but um, is that the financing the the, um, uh, the saved financing for decommissioning is way insufficient and the state is currently um, setting up a, a possibility where it will take over the full responsibility from the owner um, in order also to make up for for eventual gaps in the in the financing of decommissioning there are also quite recently discussions on whether we should not try to decommission earlier than 2045 uh, or whether we should indeed wait until 2045. The third reactor that was then um, started up and is still operating is the Borsal nuclear power station, a um, 468 megawatt power station. It is to be closed in 2033. But there are attempts for further lifetime extension beyond its 60 years anniversary then uh, to 80 years. In the meantime, the uh, government has made plans for two new nuclear reactors at the Borsal location, uh, each of them 1 to 1.6 gigawatt. Uh, we expect those to come online if it can be financed and if it works in 2035, between 2035 and 2040. And there are a lot of preliminary discussions about possible small modular reactors uh, currently in, in the provinces of Brabant, Limburg, uh, Gelderland, um, Flevoland, um, and, and probably more will come because we are in the uh, process of, of making new 
government, governments, provincial governments at this moment, and it looks like that will come up there as well. These are mainly light water reactor ideas um, and in some cases for molten salt thorium reactors. If they come online, that of course will complicate the picture of radioactive waste in the Netherlands considerably, but that is something for um, the next generation maybe. Um, in the 1960s, uh, the Netherlands was one of the countries dumping low and mid level, level radioactive waste in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this stopped in 1982 after very, very wide protests by a group called uh, Break Atomic Chain Netherlands um, and, and by Greenpeace. What you see in the picture is uh, one of the pictures of an action of Greenpeace um, at this Dutch radioactive waste dumping. Um, in 1976, um, there were proposals for deep geological storage in salt rock in the north of the country, which were then again uh, put away because of enormous protests locally and nationally on that issue. Now, the strategy of the Netherlands um, is very peculiar. It's, it's quite unique within Europe. Um, first of all, it is based on reprocessing. Um, the reprocessing is a choice of the operator. It's not a choice of the state, but it has been supported by the state. Um, and that means that if the Netherlands talk about radioactive waste, about high level waste, they only talk about the 5% of, um, of resulting radioactive waste that is vitrified in La Hague and sent back to the Netherlands. They don't talk about the rest of what is left in, in France. And that's good to keep in mind. Um, the Netherlands have um, a, um, a policy to um, temporarily store radioactive waste until 2130 in the Covra waste storage facility. Um, and they want to make a decision about disposal in the year 2100. Um, and that has led to the fact that since 1982, when, when the basis for this policy was laid, uh, the establishment, political establishment, basically considers the radioactive waste problem solved. Now, that leaves open a few questions. Um, first of all, of course, a decision about disposal in 2100 that is three generations away that is quite far um, and um, that means that it is not very clear how that can be brought in line with the responsibility of this generation for its own waste um, this this strategy has or this policy has been confirmed by the climate minister in May 2022, even though the government in its declaration, the government declaration from January 2022 had said something uh, or, or to, to another that, that could have been interpreted differently, uh, which is we will also take care for the safe permanent storage of nuclear waste. But um, the climate minister then explained that that means we already have a safe storage of nuclear waste uh, until 2130. So we will take a decision in 2100 and with that this sentence has been fulfilled. The European Commission does not agree with that and is putting pressure on the Dutch government to speed up its search for final disposal. Um, there are currently a few procedures ongoing concerning our radioactive waste. The first one is of course um, in 2016, there was the national plan under the Euratom uh, directive, and that is being implemented at this moment. In that plan, there was discussion about the setup of a reflection group that should come with um, a, a, a proposal for policy and po potential policy change. Um, but that reflection group was never established. Instead of it, they um, appointed one person 
who came with a proposal and um, then um, the, the uh, assignment was given to the Rathenau Institute, a think tank in the Netherlands, to come with a final report on how radioactive waste should be discussed in society. Um, and that report is due in 2024. It, the first two um, parts of that report already have been issued. Those were covering first the history of radioactive waste discussion in the Netherlands uh, until 2011, and then um, a report about the current uh, discussion about radioactive waste from 2011 till now. These reports have been written with a limited stakeholder inv involvement. There have been some workshops um, for, for discussion and input, um, but the reports are not widely um, spread for, for input. It's, it's, it's not like, like a full, um, a full in a, a full public participation procedure. Um, at the same time, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water has started earlier this year the preparation for the new national plan, which is due in 2025 everywhere in Europe, but also uh, in the Netherlands. And that includes a strategic environmental assessment. Yes, the pressure that we've put upon countries that these kind of plans need and uh, a strategic environmental assessment is um, bearing fruit. Now, the strategic environmental assessment and also the new national plan are currently being prepared by the consultants Mott McDonald and the consultant Abiding Energy. And a first um, informal discussion with stakeholders took place earlier this week. Concerning access to information, um, in the Netherlands, the access to information is, is organized in a new law, which is the law Wet Open Overheid, the law on open government, which um, came, uh, became active uh, two years ago to replace the old legislation um, and, and is supposed to be more comprehensive and streamline um, issues of access to information. You have to be aware that currently in the Netherlands, the, the civil society that is interested in radioactive waste is very, very small. Um, on the NGO side, we have the NGOs LACA, which is a national archive uh, on nuclear issues, an anti-nuclear archive um, that consists of a handful of volunteers from which two are very active, but they're only volunteers. Uh, then we have the organization WISE, World Information Service on Energy, which has currently three people work, working on nuclear issues, um, but none of them uh, very actively on radioactive waste with exception of part of my time. Then there's Greenpeace Netherlands, where um, I am allowed to follow what is happening on, on radioactive waste, but they don't play a very active role. Um, and then every province in the Netherlands has a Nature and Environment Federation, which is um, an umbrella organization for local NGOs, local environmental groups. And in uh, the provinces of Zeeland, Brabant, Drenthe and Groningen, there is some attention to radioactive waste because these provinces were named as potential sites. And then there are a few individuals in civil society which are following the issue already for many, many decades, Mo mainly uh, people that became active in the 1970s when the first ideas appeared for uh, deep geological disposal in the north of the Netherlands. You already can um, infer that those people are now in their 70s and 80s, um, but they still are participating actively in, in the debate. Um, we have a problem in this whole thing with the position of the Waste Management Organization. COVRA is, uh, since 2002, a 100% state-owned company. 
but it is considered to be a private company um, and it refuses consistently to adhere to the IRS convention, which means that it, um, it uses much more strict exemptions from access to information than are allowed under Aarhus. Um, that, that comes to the surface amongst others in the transparency around financing of COVRA. We have the impression that the way that COVRA finances its operations includes partially cross-financing from small producers of radioactive waste towards um, the larger amounts of waste coming from the power sector. And we have indications that the funds being built up will not be sufficient. But it is very difficult to get hands on that kind of information because COVRA considers that confidential. On the other hand, COVRA closely cooperates with the state and the regulator during court cases on access to information. So that is a very strange situation. And, and we are very strongly convinced that um, that we we have are dealing here with um, with a public company uh, state owned which is fulfilling a public service and therefore according to the findings of the ours uh, convention compliance committee on kazakhstan which was the very first findings of the accc uh, from 2004 um, COVRA should be treated as a state authority and just should be as transparent as state authorities are obliged to be. Um, public participation in the Netherlands is incorporated in different laws. Uh, the most relevant ones are the um, Environmental Protection Law and the Regulation uh, on Environmental Impact Assessment, which is based on that law, on the, on the environmental protection law. Um, that regulation stipulates what falls under the obligation for environmental impact assessment, but also how it has to be carried out. Um, for large infrastructure projects, there is now a new uniform public preparation procedure. Um, that procedure has been set up in order to speed up preparation of large infrastructural uh, projects and um, we 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 already um, we already had problems with the earlier legislation or based on the environmental protection law uh, on public participation during the um, preparation of lifetime extension of the Borsla nuclear power station before 2013 um, that case was brought to the Aarhus Convention in the end after we did not get any public participation on environmental issues for the decision of lifetime extension and we won that at the ACCC we won that on the level of the Aarhus Convention and the Dutch government then um, took steps where they said that they would improve access to inf or uh, public participation under this uniform public preparation procedure but that of course conflicts with the idea of speeding up procedures. Um, the uniform public preparation procedure exists already. Um, and we are now trying to figure out to what extent indeed that also fulfills the, um, the findings and recommendations of the Aarhus Compliance Committee. Um, in access to information, there are already a few minor conflicts, but also in public participation, we will just have to see it, what is going to happen in the coming year when the Boston nuclear power station will go in its periodic safety review, which needs to be submitted to public participation on the environment under the Aarhus Convention. And we've had preliminary, preliminary talks with the responsible authorities, but I have no idea how that's going to look yet. And of course, 2023 is running to an end very fast, so I'm very curious. Um, under these legislation, 
um, we have noticed that COVRA's research plans, as an example, are not subject to any public participation. Now, that is related to the same problem we saw already with access to information. COVRA does not consider itself falling under the IRS Convention. And I think that that is wrong. And I think that as soon as we can, and that we mean LACA and VICE, we will pick that up um, and also move that forward to the IRS Convention uh, the review. <clears throat> On the other hand, large projects from COVRA, for instance, the extension of the high level waste um, uh, installation Habog, um, they are submitted to an environmental impact assessment. Um, if we look at access to, because if you if you remember, I mean, in within the BEPA report, we um, from the Group Transparency Watch, we identified that um, not only the three pillars of the Arrows Convention, access to information, access to uh, public participation, and access to justice are important, but there should also be access to resources. Um, an issue that also has been um, uh, acknowledged by the Arrows community. Um, if we look at access to resources in the Netherlands, um, there is a very, very narrow basis in civil society at this moment, um, as I already mentioned. And um, if and and that means that 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 financially, it is it is quite difficult for people to become active. Um, the the very positive thing is that LACA. A very has a very comprehensive archive of all reports and studies on nuclear issues, including nuclear waste, that are open to the public. Um, this contains paper archive, um, but also an, an, an electronic archive. From the paper archive, about 5% has been digitalized. Um, that only speaks to the, to the, to the enormous amount of, of archive that there is. Um, LACA does not have the means to to archive, uh, sorry, to digitalize the, the entire paper archive, but it is open to the public. And we see that even uh, government advisory bodies like the consultants for the environmental impact assessment for the strategic environmental assessment for the national plan, but also the Rata Institute, even those kind of, of advisors um, rely very often for um, historical information on the LACA archive. Now, all these, uh, or this, this small civil society basis is all funded by private donations. And these are very scant. At the moment, it is impossible to find real um, structural funding for interest in nuclear energy. Um, that is one of the reasons that we have advised in the procedure for the report of the Rathenau Institute to set up um, a system where there would be funding available for local population uh, and local groups, comparable maybe to the CLIS in, in France, but also on a national level, comparable to the now dead uh, system in, uh, in Sweden. Um, because we noticed that the input from civil society has been very important in the history of the Dutch radioactive waste, um, but it will be very difficult to, to continue that if there are no resources available. If we look at access to justice, I already mentioned the problems that we have with COVRA. Um, I think in line with the IRS compliance findings from the case from 2004 in Kazakhstan, um, COVRA, there's no doubt that COVRA should fall under the IRS obligations and it is something that we need to push through. Um, for gaining access to justice, um, costs are not extremely high, but for NGOs and, and other organizations and individuals with only very small budgets, they are still problematic. Um, every time again that we do go to court, we do have to gather a few thousand or, or about a thousand euros for different administrative costs. And then 
there is no money for uh, for legal support or so for lawyers. Um, that that does hamper um, the position of civil society in court. Um, in the report for um, for the URAD uh, deliverable, we have made a few recommendations. First of all, we propose that the upcoming government stru governance structure on radioactive waste should include all stakeholders, so not only the waste management organization and the regulator, etc., but that there should be a structural place also for civil society in the form of um, ideally a central secretariat for um, civil society that will be financed by radioactive waste funds. Um, another recommendation is that um, the state, the ministry, but also other, also the legal structures, which means, for instance, the highest administrative court of the Council of State uh, submits COVRA to the obligations under the law on open government and, and the Aarhus Con Convention. Um, we also plead for active access to information for all procedures. For instance, the Eratenau reports, um, they are published, um, but they're not published widely. And the, the procedure leading to the reports is not published publicly. That is only information going around between um, participants in meetings and that on the Chatham rules. Um, and then there are no real structural ways of reviewing texts and, and giving input later. Um, we, we plead for it that all procedures, even if, if government gives an order to a consultancy to do certain things, that all these procedures will be open to a form of, um, of access to information and to a form also of public participation. We also, well, that's the, the next one. The, the Dutch structure, sh the state structure should enable and facilitate local citizens and local and national NGOs to participate in these procedures. Um, what we also would hope to see is if there is a structure coming, that it will also offer support for access to justice. There had been also recommendations in the deliverable taken up concerning um, the use of strategic environmental assessment, uh, assessments and environmental impact assessments in procedures for, for instance, the national plan. Currently, it looks like that already has its effects and that the government is following those recommendations. Of course, if they fail to follow them further, then we can go back to it. But at the moment, that looks quite okay. That was my half an hour um, update on the situation in the Netherlands at this moment. And if there are any questions, I'm very willing to answer them. Uh, if there are any views, then we can discuss them further. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. And uh, for that, you can use the chat uh, in below in the in the banner, or you can also raise your hand with uh, with a reaction button in the in the banner as well. Uh, so please don't hesitate. Are there any questions? Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? I have maybe a first one is uh, about uh, how you you want to to proceed with. Uh, uh, making uh, COVRA apply to Aarhus uh, and why you think it's not uh, compliant to Aarhus Convention? Well, first of all, it is at this moment not compliant to the Aarhus Convention because it, it does not give um, it does not give access to all environmental information and does not give access to um, all economic information related to the environment. 
I mean, this 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 issue of of financial transparency is very crucial if you want to determine whether there are sufficient funds for radioactive waste at the moment that you need it. Yeah? Now there is um, per kilowatt hour a fee for the uh, um, for the for the electricity producer. There are fees for the small producers, and one of the um, impressions we have is that there is cross finding financing from waste from smaller producers, which has a very complex structure towards uh, operation of amongst others the Haboch. Um, it, it could lead to a moment where, where there will not be sufficient financing for management that needs to take place. And for that, you do need to have insight in, in how the financing is run. It is not a company that is supposed to make a profit. Um, and if you look at the uh, findings on the case of Kazakhstan, it is very clear that a company which is state owned and provides a public service um, has the obligations under the Aarhus Convention. Now we do have a company here that is 100% state owned and the only discussion point is then is radioactive waste management a public service. We've discussed this extensively within URAT over the last few years and I think that the consensus within most of the participants with the exception of certain waste management organizations is that waste management is a public service. Um, even in, in, in the situation of, of Sweden, where the waste management organization is owned by the operators and not by the state, um, we can argue that this falls under the Aarhus Convention. Um, there are a few more cases that have run there, um, whereby companies were only had a partial state ownership, um, but with that, which were then found to be um, falling under the obligation of the Irish Convention. And I think that that definitely counts for, for COBRA. Um, how we're going to do it? We have currently a case, an information case still running at the Council of State. Um, if we lose that, we're quite likely to get LACA and uh, and probably wise to escalate that to the um, to the Irish Convention Compliance Committee, and then in about four to six years, you'll probably find out that we were right. But I I, I rather do not don't I, I don't like it coming to that point. I think the Council of State was traditionally not very open to argumentation on Aarhus, and that has changed very much since we won the case on Borsela. <clears throat> so my impression is that the next case that we will bring to the Council of State, we will probably already win on that level. Does it answer your question? Yeah, very well. And it just makes me think that in France, for example, the project is declared uh, of uh, public utility. So I guess it uh, yeah. applies a public service. So just, that's also what I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, you have a question Miles. in the chat for Miles yeah, I see and that, after Miles. Niels. And, yeah. Miles, I see that you would like to know whether the transport of waste is being just. I will, I will end my sharing so that we can see one another. Um, transport is off and on. Um, it was very heavily discussed until 2013 um, when, when, nuclear, when there was still a bit of a nuclear debate in the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands are transporting spent fuel to La Hague in France by train. Um, and that transport runs through Belgium and that runs through a few Belgian cities. And the city of Ghent, for instance, has passed motions in the past where they said that they don't want those transports anymore through the cities because of the uh, <clears throat> of the related risks. Um, Lately, um, we have asked, uh, or LACA has asked um, the regulator to stop these transports because they argue they cannot be justified 
the risks will not be justified. But that was not accepted by the Council of State a month ago or four weeks ago. Um, there, so there is some discussion, but it is extremely marginal nowadays. There are no direct actions anymore against these transports like there used to be in the past. And, and there is no real public attention to them. Um, within the nuclear regulator, they're basically taken as we're always doing it. And um, there doesn't seem to be any risk there. So it isn't really a problem. Then there is a question also from Miles about deep geological storage uh, or disposal as the method for, it's not for spent fuel, it's for vitrified waste from uh, from reprocessing and i think that's important to notice because the issue of reprocessing is also not really discussed and there is this <coughs> fake um uh, idea that that uh, reprocessing is heavily reducing the waste well in volume that is definitely not true but the large part of the volume of that waste remains in france and in um, in radioactivity, um, yes, we, we get only a fraction of the radioactive content back to the Netherlands in vitrified waste, but um, the large stock of reprocessed uranium and reprocessed plutonium is remaining in France waiting for use in one or another way. Um, but it's it's very unclear whether that ever will be used. And if it's not used, well, shouldn't we consider it waste at that time? I mean, there there are no contracts that would guarantee use. And in my opinion, we should then consider it waste. Now, that is a special situation for the Netherlands. It's the only European country, ex um, yeah, at this moment still, except for Russia, still reprocessing waste, and France, of course, but the only one that is exporting its waste to another country. Um, for the, the choice of um, of deep geological disposal, that is the only investigated um, method with one smaller research program from Erdo, the international. Oh, yeah, that's a point that I haven't explained very well in my presentation, but the Netherlands are setting on a so-called so dual track, which means that they um, are preparing for a deep geological disposal in 2130, um, but they also keep open the door to an international option where Dutch radioactive waste would go to another country for deep geological disposal. In that track, uh, the international track, there is some research within Erdo now to, um, to sharing experience and, and information about the potential of deep geology of deep very deep boreholes um, dry storage in the netherlands has been excluded explicitly with the argumentation that the largest part of the netherlands is under sea level and that that risk would be too high in case of ongoing climate change that is an official argumentation that is used Miles, is that, that answering your questions a bit? Apparently, yes. And it's uh, Nielsen, uh, I think it has the floor, then Nadia and okay. Michelle. Okay. And then Michal. Niels. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, at one uh, point, you mentioned that uh, there's uh, dissatisfaction in the European uh, Commission uh, because mm -hmm. uh, Apparently, the, the plans for final disposal uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, is not uh, progressing uh, quickly enough, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Uh, this uh, dissatisfaction, uh, how, how does it uh, manifest it, itself? Uh, uh, are there uh, sanctions? Are the sanctions on the way? Is uh, a dialogue between the European Commission and, and the, the Dutch uh, uh, government? Uh, I mean, what what uh, what is happening in this uh, regard? Well, the only thing I can tell you is that there is an infringement procedure of the Euroton radioactive waste uh, 
directive under the Eurotunnel directive waste uh, radioactive waste directive but of course I have no idea what's in that infringement procedure I do know that there is communication going between uh, the European Commission and the Dutch authorities about the fact that the 2130 deadline is too far away and also the 2100 decision is too far, far away um, it, it, it returns regularly now in, in discussions I have with Dutch authorities about it, both from the ministries, that's the Ministry of Climate and the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water, and with the regulator. And then what I notice is that, that the Dutch position still is, well, we've chosen for this option now and we're not going to change it. We know that the European Commission is not happy with it and we try to convince them that this is still sufficient. And my impression is it's, it's going on now for a few years already and it's returning every time again that the European Commission is not taking this um, as satisfactory. Um, but that is, I, I don't have direct, um, direct documentational evidence to back that up at this moment. It is from, from my talks with the Commission and with, uh, with the authority involved that I get this impression. Nadja. If, if I may follow up uh, okay. with, yeah, with yeah. Uh, another qu question related uh, to this. Uh, uh, as I understand it, the, the, the Laka Foundation at uh, some years mm -hmm. ago uh, actually filed a, a legal uh, complaint uh, before the, the, I think, uh, one of the national courts in, in the Netherlands, uh, but they actually lost uh, the the uh, this 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 lo lo lawsuit. Uh, uh, so so there's no uh, legal obligation apparently under uh, uh, Dutch law uh, to uh, come up with a solution uh, for the for this uh, final disposal within a, a certain time frame. No, I guess. That is, no, that is that was. Um on the basis also of the first national plan um, and that was dismissed by the Council of State and um, with that I mean the only thing that was left over for us was communicate that to uh, the European Commission and that is also one of the reasons the European Commission keeps nagging on about it um, but within Dutch law there is no real real potential to to overturn this this official policy Yes, Nadia. thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to share the experience from uh, Slovenian case um, where they also didn't want to provide the financial data about the waste management in general. And uh, it was denied uh, by the waste management organization to share the data, although mm -hmm. it was clear that the, there was a report behind. Uh, so the what our NGOs did, they uh, used the law on the public information and they received the data afterwards. So yeah. basically, I don't know whether the your organization or the Dutch organization uh, did, did that. Well, that is where that we're now waiting for um, a verdict from the Raad van State for the Council of State on that issue. Uh, but the indications are that they are going to follow the line they've always followed, which was consider COVRA as a private entity. Um, and if that happens, then we are definitely going to escalate it towards arrows because I think the interpretation that your court has followed here is the right one. Yeah, um, but, I mean, even if until... the if the sector is private, so called private. Yeah. Uh, uh, although it's funded by public money, I don't know. Uh, they are obliged to this. This uh, was the case in our in our uh, condition. So also the MPP needs to reveal all the data. Mm -hmm. No, but that is that is um, under our whose jurisprudence is the logical way to go, yeah. and um, yeah. we we just have a bit of a legacy where. Um, the 
Dutch legal system more or less considered the Irish Convention interesting for all you Central and Eastern European and states and the stands. Um, but um, we were already good enough. I mean, that was basically basically the, the way that they were dealing with it. And um, until we won the case on Wurzelen, references to the Irish Convention were always wiped aside as they're not relevant because uh, you don't have uh, they don't have direct working for for citizens. Now I think that that is now overturned, so it may be that the Council of State now will will side with LACA, but I'm not I'm not completely convinced that they will. Okay, thanks. Um, Michal asked why the first MPP Dordewaard has been mothballed instead of um, undergoing direct decommissioning. Um, no, there's no restart. I mean, there is not even there is not even uh, a functioning reactor inside of it anymore. Um, but um, the idea is initially was if you have a, de a a closed nuclear power station and you let it stand for 40 to 60 years, that then the um, radioactivity will have decreased so much that it is a lot cheaper and easier to decommission it. And um, in the 1960s, um, that was still the preferred option um, that was expressed by most countries in Europe and, and indeed in the world for, for dealing with, uh, with old nuclear reactors. And Dodewaard is one of the last reactors that was um, closed under these criteria. Um, which also means that there were not sufficient funds at the moment that it was shut down because the idea was the um, the capital that is there will also build up with interest on interest etc over the 40 50 years that it takes before we're going to decommission it so there were not not there were not sufficient funds and what we see now is that because interest rates are not a stable issue over time, um, the growth of the capital does not keep up with the growth of the costs. And therefore, there is quite a considerable gap between the money that has been uh, gathered so far, which is in the order of, I think, 200, 300 million euros, and the money that is actually needed, which will be almost double that. Um, and the question is now, who is going to pay for that? Um, will that be the owners? And the owners um, are now organized in a very small, tiny company, um, which is basically overseeing the power station as it stands now. That's a very low key uh, guarding um, uh, operation um, and consists of of the former utilities who owned it when it was operating, but they don't want to put more money in it. And it's it's a very difficult case, which already has been in court for several times. And the state and the little, small company owning it are now negotiating a way out in which the state would take over the power station and become sole responsible for its decommissioning. It's a bit the the way that the Germans have dealt with the issue. Um, Reprocessed uranium and plutonium are property and legal responsibility of France. Now, that is, of course, um, as long as France thinks that it can be a resource, they don't mind that. But I'm pretty sure that they will come to a form of renegotiation if they notice they cannot reuse it further um, and it will become a a waste issue. Um, it's just that as long as there are people dreaming of fourth generation reactors and dreaming of large um, an, an, an ever growing growth of the nuclear sector um, and therefore also an ever growing growth for a demand for MOX fuel. Um, France will not be on the point that it is going to renegotiate this. Um, 
but if I'm a bit more realistic, the stockpiles that France has at the current moment, both in plutonium and reprocessed uranium, are so large. Um, they, they have tried already to um, dump quite a bit of reprocessed uranium towards Russia, so-called for um, further processing, so as a resource, but a large part of that will be is to remain in Russia. Um, and the question is, of course, um, do you accept this morally? Um, because Russia is not going to reuse it. Or will Russia try to negotiate it on the long term? Well, that will be decades away from now after the current uh, incursion in, in Ukraine. Um, so it's, it's not an easy situation, but in reality, I consider um, that with reprocessing, you should not only look at the waste that is returned to you, both in volume and radiation content, but you continue to have on the basis of the Euratom radioactive waste directly, you continue to have at least moral responsibility also for the uranium and plutonium that remains in France and in principle also of the low and high level radioactive waste that remains in France, which is a huge volume. Um, the, the, the official way that I deal with it, Michael, is that they say we send back to the Netherlands the equivalent, or, or no, sorry, we send back the radio, the high level waste that is left over from reprocessing, plus a bit more of high level waste, which is in radiation equivalent to the radiation um, encapsulated in the entire inventory of low and mid-level waste that is produced in the process. So this huge volume remains in France. And instead of that, a very tiny volume of very high level waste is from France is sent back to the, or is sent to the Netherlands um, as a kind of an exchange. And I think that that system um, looks nice legally, but I think morally, the Netherlands, if they consider uh, minimizing radioactive waste as important, they should also take into account the increase in volume and uh, the fact that that large volume remains in, uh, in France. Are there any more questions? Um, I don't think so. Well, then we're exactly in time. And I thank you for a very interesting discussion. Yeah. And I hope to work with you further on this issue in the coming years. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. <coughs>